Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the chapel this morning. We're back in John's Gospel, chapter 17, if you want to turn there. And uh, as I said uh, last week, uh, Rob didn't guarantee whether I'd come back from Honduras or not, but I did come back. But I kept telling him, stop introducing me as your partner. People are... (laughs) I'm your traveling companion. (laughs) People started looking at me funny. This is my partner. You know. (laughs) You got to be careful what you say today, don't you? Yeah. Oh, my. Hmm. Uh, and the allergies, oh my goodness, huh? Yeah. The pollen, the ragweed, boy, be careful out there now, okay? Yeah. yeah. But it's so good to be home. It's good to go, but it's always good to be home. And uh, Lord willing, uh, towards the end of the year, we're going to be trying to organize a trip to bring some of the fellas down because there's a great need for discipleship among the men in the island of Halim. Halim is an island off of the coast of Honduras. You have a large island called Roatan. Anybody been to Roatan before? No, nobody's ever been to Rotan. It's a tourist island. Uh, there's a lot of cruise ships that uh, make it a port of destination. But off of the island of Roatan is a little island called Halim. And there's about a thousand residents there. And many of them, many of them, very open to the gospel, uh, would profess Christianity. But there's a strong need for discipleship, just as there is in our country. There's such a need for discipleship among the body of Christ. There's such ignorance with regard to what people say they believe about the word of God. Uh, amen? Amen. Hmm. Yeah. And the other thing I wanted to mention, you know, who, who stands for life here? If, you're, if you stand for life and you're against abortion, would you stand up? Wow, that's almost, that's 100% of you. <laughs> My goodness. Will you stand with me next Saturday? Yes? Yeah. yes? Yeah. Oh, wait a minute, that was weak. Yeah. Will you stand with me next Saturday against this holocaust of abortion? Yes. I hope so. Yes. I hope we have a great turnout next week. I hope the 100% of you will be with me next week as we stand against this, this slaughter of innocent children in our society. You can sit down. Now, I, here's what I want you to understand, and I, 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 say this with, I say this with a grieved heart. Our culture is lost. It's lost. Short of the Lord Jesus Christ making intervention, there is no hope for us turning this culture around. The Bible tells me that as we approach the time of the end, and I do believe we're in the time of the end, that things will get worse and worse. Evil will be seen as good, and good will be seen as evil. And that's precisely where we are today. And unfortunately, I would, it grieves me to share with you that the majority of people who call themselves Christian today are not. They're not. They're Christian in name only. Beloved, listen with your eyes. Listen with your eyes, that'll tell you everything, right? If you listen with your eyes, people live what they believe. And you listen with your eyes, and you'll know who they are. And if truly there were 205 million Christians in the United States of America, would abortion be legal? No. That's weak. Would abortion be legal? No. no, of course it wouldn't. But why is it legal? Because the majority of Christendom is not the church. Make no mistake about that. I saw a little, a little saying this week. It said, the person you know how did it go again? Let me think. Uh, Terry Holland, are you here? Where is she? She's upstairs. Oh, she sent it to Rob, and I saw it. It said, the person you think you know is not the person you know. There's one person that you know, and there's another person that you don't know, right? Why? We, I, I've been talking about that. That's the what person? Shadow. The shadow man. The shadow man, shadow woman. There's one person we want to present, right? This persona that we want to present publicly. But then for way too many people, there's another person who isn't anything like that public persona that we truly are, and that's what we call hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. And those two need to come into alignment. Yeah. Ladies, listen to me. When some man is courting you, what is he going to present to you? That's right. You're not going to find out who he is until when? About two years into the marriage. 
I'm serious. Then, you, then you're going to find out who he really is. That hidden person, that shadow person, right? So you need to be very, very careful. Take your time getting to know them. Because we can be carried away by infatuation. We can be carried away by romance. We can be carried away by our feelings, right? And they're just feelings, nothing more than. Hmm. We, don't have any, we don't have too many crooners in here either, do we? <laughs> But beloved, I, my encouragement to you in this 11th hour that we are in is to be as real a lover and a worshiper of Jesus Christ as God will allow you to be. It's only him that does that in our heart. But what's required of you is a surrender. As a woman would submit and surrender to the man that she loves and reflect, be the uh, reflection of his glory, and that's what, what should happen in marriage, so too, we are to reflect the glory of our Savior as we surrender and submit to him and the Holy Spirit works within us to become everything he wants us to be in this defiled culture. We should be so different from the rest of this culture. We should be transformed, right? Last time we were together, we talked about the resurrection. What's the evidence, the affirmation, the validation of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? The changed life, the resurrected spirit within you. For in Adam all died, but in Christ all are made alive. Your spirit is made alive. And when your spirit is made alive, when you're born again in Jesus Christ, you're a changed person. And you know where that change shows itself more than any place else? Right here. Right here. In this relationship, at home. So if you're not being Christ at home, you got no business playing Jesus anywhere else because you're just playing. You understand? Enough said on that, right, Jake? Okay, let's go to chapter 17 of John's Gospel. John's Gospel is really the Passover Gospel. It really begins in chapter 2. He's making his way to Jerusalem for the Passover. And we know that the most intimate relationship that Jesus Christ, the most tender moments that he had with his disciples were covered here in John's Gospel, chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. What was he doing then? Passover. They were celebrating the Passover Seder. Jesus was sharing his last thoughts, concerns, admonitions with those whom he loves before he leaves this place. And so we looked extensively at that in chapters 14, 15, 16, talked about the, the work of the Holy Spirit that the, the Lord would leave us. Not orphaned. He'll never leave us nor forsake us, but he will leave his spirit among us, with us, in us, to empower us for the work of the ministry. Remember the work of the spirit where he comes para alongside you. He comes in, E-N, English, uh, Greek preposition like our English word, I-N. He comes to dwell within you. And then for empowering for ministry, he comes epi upon you. Now, I, I pray that most of you experienced at least the first two, the para. And then the end, where you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, recognize that he died for your sins. And now you give your life in exchange for him giving his life for you. And then, and then you know the calling that he has upon your life for ministry, and then the epi. Yeah. How many are married here? Raise your hand. That's a calling. You see, that's a call of ministry, to be married. You're called now to be used of the Lord to be life-giving to that person you're living with. Christ life giving, right? Unfortunately, too often, it's uh, what we can receive rather than what we can give. But in the proper relationship, we understand the other centeredness of Christ and his spirit within us. It's all that we can give to the other person for their well-being. Amen? Yeah. Well, look at John 17 for a minute. This is, this is called the high priestly prayer of Jesus. The other prayer that we pray, our Father who art in heaven, that's, that's the disciples' prayer. Jesus taught us how to pray, how we should pray. But here is Jesus' prayer. He first prays for himself, then he prays for his disciples, and then he prays for us, all of us. We're not going to get very far in the chapter this morning. But look at verse 1. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. 
He kept saying, my hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. He determined when he would die. He, nobody took his life. He laid down his life, didn't he? The hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. Jesus lives to glorify the Father. We're to live to glorify the Son. For as you have given him authority, the Father has given Jesus authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Wow. Verse 6. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Verse 7, now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. Verse 9, I pray for them. Do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Verse 11, now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. Verse 12, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name, those whom you gave me. Get the point? <laughs> who gave who to whom? Yeah, what you said. The Father gave the church the bride as a gift to the Son. Do you understand that? No man chooses to be saved. I just want you to understand that. Sovereignty or salvation is a sovereign work of God. Monogenistic, not synergistic, right? You know the difference. Monogenism? One way. one way. Only one individual, right? It was him. Not synergistic. It wasn't both of us. It wasn't a bilateral decision. It was a unilateral decision that God chose us. While we were yet sinners, God chose us before the foundations of the world had ever come into existence that God chose to save us to redeem us, and to give us as a gift to his son. Isn't that amazing? Think about that. In Romans chapter 15, it says, you don't need to turn there. Romans 15, 4 says, for whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. What was Paul talking about there? What was given for our learning? The Old Testament. All of the Old Testament. The law, the Psalms, the Proverbs, the wisdom literature, the prophetic writings of the scriptures, all given for our learning. You see, we can best understand and interpret the New Testament from a lot of the examples or pictures or types or signs Jesus has given us in the Old Testament. So that's what I want to look at this morning. Is there something for us to learn in the Old Testament relative to what we're understanding here in chapter 17 that God gave the church as a gift to his son? Go with me to Genesis chapter 24. Now, we know that in the beginning of Genesis, God had chosen a man to represent him to the world, and through that man, a people that would come. And through those people, the word of God. And through the word of God, the Messiah himself. And so who was that man? No. Abraham. God chose Abraham. Abraham was the one he had chosen. And, and so in the early chapters of Genesis, we see the emphasis upon Abraham. But beginning in chapter 21, what, what happens in chapter 21? This is Genesis chapter 20. What happens in 21? Isaac is born. Isaac. Who is Isaac? The, God of, the son of promise. He is the son of promise. Isaac. Right? How old was Abraham when Isaac was born? Very old. Very old, very old. <clears throat> John the Baptist. His parents were very old when they had him, right? What were his parents' names, Angel? Zacchaeus. Zacharias. Zacharias. And Elizabeth. And, Elizabeth. And, and their boy's name? John, Juan. Is that your name, Juan? Yeah. You know, you know what Zacharias means? 
God remembers. Not like some of you. <laughs> God remembers. What's Elizabeth mean? His covenant or his oath. What's John mean? Right there, you have the gospel and there are three names. Wow, isn't that amazing? And he came as a forerunner, right? Right? To, to announce the true son of promise who would come to redeem the world. But, but Isaac, Isaac, Isaac is a type, right? He was a son of promise. You know, we know what happened earlier, right? Sarah thought, well, God's plan isn't working out. We need to have plan B. Everybody wants to know what, what uh, Elon Musk's plan B is, right? <laughs> if you're following that story. But so Sarah had Abraham conceive a child through her handmaiden, Hagar. And his name was? Oy vey, what a problem that's been ever since, right? Ishmael, and they follow the Ishmaelites and the descendants of the Ishmaelites, and what a problem they have been for Exoc and his descendants, Jacob and the children of Israel. So chapter 21 is the birth of the son of promise. So Isaac is a type of what? Christ. Christ. Abraham a type of? God the Father. So in chapter 22, what happens there? Chapter 22. Chapter 23, she died. Chapter 22, God tells Abraham, take now thy son, thy only son, Exoc, Isaac. He would not recognize the son of the flesh. God will never recognize anything you do in the flesh. God will never recognize what, the, what Christendom has been doing in the flesh. As that house church leader from China came and visited all the churches in the States, and he's about to embark and go back to China and ask them, what did you think, Brother. He said, it's amazing what the church in the West has been able to do without the Holy Spirit. It's true, you know. But God will never honor, never recognize anything we do in the flesh, only what he has done through us, through the person of the Holy Spirit. Take now thy son, thy only son, Ixach, and bring him to a place I will show you. Remember? Yeah. And so Abraham immediately saddled the donkey, took his servants, took his son, and away they went. How old was Ixach at this time? Probably in his 30s. Probably in his 30s at this time. He was a man. He wasn't a boy like you see in the Sunday school books and the little Sunday school stories. No, 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 no. He could have easily overpowered his father. And so immediately they saddled the donkey and away they go. And there's no mention of Abraham mentioning this at all to Sarah. Why? He would have never got out of the encampment. <laughs> How old was Sarah when she had Isaac? 90. She never, she never had a child before in her life, right? And now 90 years old, she gives birth to a son, the son of promise, Ixach. How do you think she felt about that boy? Whew. Yeah. She took good care of that boy. You got to know that they had to absolutely want, you know, my wife, my first wife, Roberta, she had such a wonderful relationship with her son, Richard. And she just adored that boy, and that boy adored her, and, and they had such a close relationship. Whenever he wanted to be comforted, whenever he needed to be consoled, whenever he, he, he'd call his mother. He wouldn't call me. I don't understand that. I'll comfort you, boy. <laughs> but he'd call his mother, and she adored that boy. And there are times in his life where I had to tell him some very difficult things, but I had to make sure that the she-bear wasn't around when I said it. You know what I'm talking about. So Abraham would have never got out of the encampment if, she, if he had informed Sarah of what God had told him to do. But isn't it amazing? Immediately he goes. And they go a three-day journey. Where'd they go? Mount Moriah. Where's Mount Moriah today? The Temple Mount, Mount Zion. Calvary. Wow. Did God intend to have Abraham sacrifice his son, Ixach? No, never. Now, now, from the Jewish perspective, you know, always for you Goyam, you Gentiles, you've always heard that the emphasis is upon Abraham's sacrifice of his son. But from a Jewish perspective, what do they call this chapter 22? The Akadah, the Akadah. And what does that mean? The binding of Isaac. The Jews always emphasize Isaac's willingness to be bound and to offer himself as a sacrifice. Wow, isn't that amazing? Yeah, and that's precisely what Jesus did, didn't he? Now, that was chapter 22. So, chapter 21, the birth of the Son of Promise. Chapter 22, this, this type of Jesus Christ, right? Because Isaac represents Jesus. Abraham represents God the Father. And how, how God himself would provide the sacrifice centuries later, millennium later, there on that same place, that same spot, where the blood of his Son would be shed for the sins of the world. 
You know, verse 23, something, chapter 23, something very tragic happens in the family. What happens? Sarah, Sarah dies. Sarah dies. I, I, I know how, how uh, painful and grieving it was for my son when his mother died. To this day, I mean, he still grieves over his mother's passing. But we're thankful we're going to see her again. It wasn't goodbye. It's I'll see you later. But make no mistake, Isaac grieved over the death of his mother. He loved his mother dearly, and she loved him. And now she was gone. So we pick it up in verse 24, a type, a sign, a symbol of what we're reading in John chapter 17. So pick, pick it up with me in chapter 24. Chapter 24 of Genesis. Do you have a heading in your Bible? Very good. A bride for Isaac. That's precisely what's happening now. Now, Abraham was old, well advanced in age. I guess he was, wasn't he? About how old was Abraham at this time? Do you know? 140 years old. Who said that? Did you say that, Gail? Who said that? 140. 140. That's right, Pat. He was 140 years old. So that makes Isaac how old? 40. Isaac was born when Abraham was 100. Sarah was... 90. See, ladies, there's hope for you yet. <laughs> you know, I, to I told my son I was going to be marrying Gail. Oh, he said, oh. And I said, yeah, and Gail and I decided we're going to have as many children as the Lord will allow us to have. <laughs> really? Yeah, but you know, she can't have any children. <laughs> it's the first time I said my son was silent. <laughs> 140 years old. He was well advanced in age, and, and Sarah, his wife, Isaac's mother, was gone, and Isaac had been grieving at this point, and it's very grievous. It's very sorrowful. We grieve, but not as those who have no hope, but, you know, when we lose somebody, we grieve, don't we? Yeah, yeah I'm going to lose a good friend of mine pretty soon in New York, and I'm going to have to go back to uh, share at his funeral. And, and I love this man, uh, but he's going to go to a better place, and one day we'll all be there, right? Eh? So Abraham was, well, was old, well advanced in age. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Abraham was an extremely wealthy man, but he was a very giving man as well. So Abraham said to his oldest servant of his house, who ruled over all that he had, please put your hand under my thigh. Who's this servant? How do you know that? That's right. Chapter 15 names this servant. This is the chief servant, the head servant, who was in charge of all that Abraham had. Almost like a business partner. Not the other kind of partner. <laughs> but he was in charge of all that he had, and he made him swear an oath, and he said, put your hand under my thigh. Now, that's not precisely where he put his hand. Children, any children in here today? No. Okay. Yes? Children? He put his hand on his reproductive powers. And he is swearing, he's going to swear by any descendants that Abraham has that if he doesn't fulfill this oath and this promise that he makes to his master, that his descendants will come after him and judge him accordingly for it. That's what it means to put his hand under his thigh, where, on where your reproductive powers are, where the power of life is, okay? And so he made him do that. He said, put your hand under my thigh. And his name was what? Eliezer. Oh. What does Eliezer mean? God is my comfort. God is help. The God of help or like in the New Testament, the comforter is the parakletos, the Holy Spirit. He's a comforter. He's the God of help. Eliezer. Isn't that interesting? Now, now, the only time his name is mentioned was there in chapter 15. There'll be no mention of this servant in all of chapter 24. Engineered that way by the Holy Spirit for a specific purpose. So Abraham said to his oldest servant of his house, who ruled over all that he had, please put your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. Why was the problem with that? Well, back in chapter 9, he cursed the Canaanites. There's the curse of Canaanites. But the Bible tells us in the New Testament, we are not to be unequally yoked. For what fellowship has light with darkness? What fellowship has the devil with Christ? What fellowship has an unbeliever with a believer? Now, listen to me, girls. 
No missionary dating. You don't date him in hopes that he might get saved. Okay? Bad decision. That begins a life of compromise already. And you will regret your decision later on, I guarantee you. Right? And you gentlemen as well. You look for a woman who loves God far more than she'll ever love you. And she'll be everything you need her to be. Right? Do not be unequally yoked. Now, if two believers come to me and they want me to counsel them, they're, they're equally yoked, aren't they? Because they're unbelievers. Right? But a believer can marry a believer. An unbeliever can marry an unbeliever. But believers should not marry unbelievers. Do not. Do not take my son and get a daughter, a, a daughter of the Canaanites for him as a wife. That's what Abraham is saying here. And I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but you shall go to my country and to my family and take a wife for my son Isaac. Oh, how far is he going to have to travel, this servant of his? That's right. It's 450 mile journey from where they are in the promised land to go back to Mesopotamia to Nahor, the land of Nahor, where Abraham was fun. 450 miles. Now, it's not like uh, our, the luxuries we have today jump on a plane and here we are. You know, I got on a plane in, in the morning in Greenville Spartanburg. I'm in Honduras that afternoon. It's just that the return trip was difficult. My flight was delayed and I ended up staying in Miami. But that happens. But nonetheless, if I had to do all of that by foot and boat, well, it would take me days, weeks, right? 450 miles. This is no small journey. Now, what did this servant stand to lose or gain? Everything. You see, all that Abraham has, if Abraham dies because he has no heir, where does it go? To Eleazar. All that he has. What motivation does Eliezer have to go and find a wife for his master's son, Isaac? Just love and obedience to his master. You understand that? He's, a, he's got everything to lose, nothing to gain, but he truly does, doesn't he? Yeah. He who would seek to save his life in this life will, but he who loses their life for my sake will. Yeah, do you believe that? Yeah, I hope you do. All the me first guys left, right? Yeah, that was last week. Yeah. yeah. And the servant said to him, perhaps the woman will not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I take your son back to the land from which you came? And Abraham said to him, beware that you not take my son back there. Why? Why? They're in the promised land. We're headed to the promised land, aren't we, beloved? You don't want to... Remember who? Lot's wife. What did she do? She looked back. She got assaulted on the way out of town. Because she looked back, right? Nothing back there for you. Nothing back there in the old life. No, 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 no. Abraham and his son Isaac were now in the land that God had promised them. They were in the promised land, and they were not to go back. Now, listen to me. You're saved? I, I pray, and I hope everybody here is saved, that you truly have become born again. Your spirit has been resurrected from the dead because your spirit was dead to God, right, and the things of God, and now it's been resurrected, and you're living a transformed life. Now, the danger is you have the ability, the freedom, the free will to go back and make some very bad choices and act like that old man and old woman again. Is there anything for you back there? No. That's weak. No. Is there anything back there for you? No. 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 Oh, but you know, when, when, when we suffer some difficulties, some troubles in life, some tribulations, stresses, testings, the tendency is to go back into what was our comforts. In the old life. Oh, be very, very, very careful. There is nothing in that for us any longer. We've entered into the abundant, victorious life in Jesus Christ. Is that not true? Yes. Amen. What's the abundant, victorious life? Godliness. Godliness with contentment is great gain. That's the abundant, victorious life. Paul told us. Live a godly life and then be, be content. <laughs> a rare commodity among Americans, isn't it? We're never satisfied, are we? We have garage sales to get rid of the new stuff that we got to get rid of to make room for more new stuff that we don't use. 
right? Very few really understand what that abundant, victorious life is. Being a godly person. Being the same in private as you are in public. Being the same outside as you are inside is such a peace, such a joy, such a comfort. I was, the last night I was in Honduras, I was at a place called Seascapes, a beautiful resort right there on the ocean. It was gorgeous, a beautiful swimming pool. I couldn't enjoy any of it. You know why? My wife wasn't with me. What, what, what good is any of that if you're not with someone you love to enjoy it together? Isn't that true? The Bible, the Bible said, the Bible says an elder is not to be a striker. But I got people who can take care of this. <laughs> oh, come on, get back, get back, get back, come on. What if she's not willing to follow me? Verse 6, but Abraham said to him, beware that you do not take my son back there. The Lord God of heaven who took me from my father's house and from the land of my family and who spoke to me and swore to me saying to your descendants, I will give this land. I will send an angel before you and you shall take a wife for my son from there. I believe what God has said to you. Do you? Now, there's no way that Abraham could have realized that. There was no evidence whatsoever for him to see at that time that that was going to take place. Oh, but he lived it in his heart. And listen, listen. The most precious things that we believe that God has given us through his word is not believed in our head. It's believed in our, and it'll change your life. I know a lot of people have a lot of information in their head, but they're not living in accordance with God's word. Walk in the truth of God's word. It has to be in your heart for you to walk it out in life. You understand that? Abraham believed God. There's no question as far as he was concerned. Hey, hey, I don't know about you, but I believe I'm going to jump off this earth pretty soon. Do you? Yeah. I'm getting ready. You know? No reason for me to believe that other than it's in the word of God. But God said it. I believe it, and that settles it, Right? If the woman, verse 8, is not willing to follow you, then you will be released from this oath. Only do not take my son back there. And so the servant put his hand under the thigh of his, Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. Verse 10, then the servant took 10 of his master's camels and departed from, for all his master's goods were in his hand. And he arose and he went to Mesopotamia. This was a northwestern area of Mesopotamia to the city of Nahor. Who was Nahor? <laughs> Yep, you're close. What? Abraham's brother. Yes. Nahor was Abraham's brother. So his children would be Isaac's cousin. Cousin. So we'll see Rebecca's a kissing cousin. Hmm. <laughs> it was okay then. <laughs> in verse 10, what do you see in that text? In verse 10, what do you see there? Yes, immediate obedience. Abraham spoke it, the type of God. The servant heard it, and he went. How about you? Do you obey immediately? I was a parking Nazi this morning. <laughs> Park in the back. Okay, next week I'll be the parking, uh, pa sit, sitting, seating Nazi. What, what don't you understand about that? What don't you understand about parking in the back? <laughs> tell, tell me, what, you know, you're having a problem with English. Do I need to explain it to you? So you park in the back. <laughs> if you're regular, if you're regular here, okay? If you're irregular, we'll find out. <laughs> listen, it's, a, it's, just, a, listen, it's a, just a matter of obedience. I remember this young man, he came to me and he said, Pastor, will you disciple me? And he came to me with a good friend of mine. Now, some of you may remember him, Randy Blackwell. And he said, will you, do, Pastor Rick, will you disciple me? I said, yeah, sure. It's going to take about two to three years, but I will. 
This young man had long hair. I pulled out a $20 bill out of my pocket, and I said, now go get a haircut. <sighs> you see the reaction I got, right? Now, he didn't say anything, but I could tell by the look on his face, his content. Oh, he was upset, and I walked away. He had the 20 in hand, standing there with my friend Randy, and I walked away. He was livid. Who does he think he is? Blah, 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 blah. So later on, I said, I understand you had a problem with my request for you to get a haircut. But yet you want me to disciple you to follow Christ. If I can't even get you to cut your hair, how in the world am I going to get you to follow Christ? To surrender your life. And to lay down your life for Jesus Christ. If you won't obey me in one simple little request like getting a haircut. Beloved, is that not true? So if you won't obey me in some simple little request as your pastor to... What does that say about you? I'm so serious. I'm serious. Now listen, you need to examine your heart. Why? Because your heart is rebellious as mine is. Do you understand that? Yeah. Now, the only exception to that are those who are handicapped or the elderly or my queen. So, <laughs> You are sitting in the front, yeah. Does that name make sense to you? You know, it, it, it's amazing what people will do for money and how little they'll do for love. You can get people to do almost anything for the right amount of money. Is that not true, beloved? But when it comes to love, for love's sake, it's another matter, isn't it? So what does that mean most of those people are? Prostitutes. A prostitute will give her love for money. Right? I don't, I don't mean to convict anybody. I'm not trying to step on your toes. What am I trying to do? Touch your heart. I want to touch your heart. Just, listen, I, I came to the Lord as such a rebellious young man. But God has to temper that rebellion. He has to get rid of that rebellion. He has to die off. Abraham servant immediately. No, he had so much to lose because all that was Abraham's was his and Abraham was a, one of the richest men in the world at that time. But immediately he takes 10 camels and away he goes. And he made his camels kneel down outside of the city. That's the city of Nahor, Mesopotamia. He went the 450 mile journey and they knelt down outside of the city by the wall of the wall, by the well of water at evening time and women Go out to draw water. Why would they go out in the evening time? It's the cool of the day. <laughs> I remember I was in India, and it was later on in the evening after dinner, and all these women came to the well to draw water. And boy, were they picking on one woman. I don't know what the situation was. They were speaking uh, in Amharic language, Indian language and dialect, but they were giving her a terrible time. What does that make you think of? The, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. Why did she go out in the middle of the day? So she wouldn't be harassed by the rest of the women in the village. Yeah, that's why. But here, going out in the cool of the evening to draw water. In verse 12, then he said, Oh, Lord God of my master, Abraham, please give me success this day and show kindness towards my master, Abraham. The servants trusting in the Lord, not his own ability. What does Proverbs 3, 4, 5, and 6 say? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not on their own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him in what? Yeah, literally in the Hebrew, make your way smooth. Yeah, but you've got to trust the Lord first. Hmm? And so the servant, the servant knew he couldn't be trusted in making this determination. Hmm. God had to make that determination of who it was that would be suitable for his master's son, Isaac. Hmm? Do we make the determination who's saved? Who determines who gets saved? God does. But we trust the Lord, don't we? Yeah, and so our adventure is to, to, to go out and find out who it is that the Holy Spirit is working on. Who does the Holy Spirit have a target on? You know? And then we invest there, right? I was talking to one of the men uh, who's a, who plants a lot of crops in Haleen, in Honduras, and you know how they determine where the good ground is to plant their crops? They throw seed everywhere. 
because it's, it's like volcanic rock, the island. But there are places where the island is fertile and you can grow some good vegetables there. And the vegetables are delicious, carrots like this. But nonetheless, they throw seed everywhere. And you know what they look for? Wherever it sprouts. Ah, that's where we plant, right there, right there. Where should you be planting? Right, where it grows the seed. Where should you be fishing? Where the fish are, right? <laughs> all the women, oh, Deborah, you would appreciate this. All the women, Helene, they fish too. I went to a, a, a local restaurant there. It's a little shack, but then they, they cook your meal. And so the woman who does the cooking went out fishing that evening. She caught 52 pounds of fish. Fresh fish. Wow, nice. Yeah. Hey, hey. The rest of them didn't hear that, and that's good. Later on in the year, they're going to have a fishing tournament just for the residents of the island. Like I said, there's about 1,000 people on the island, but they're having a fishing tournament, and they've invited me down to uh, help with the tournament, and I'm going to invite some of you fellas to come along. Now, you can fish. You just can't fish and be a part of the tournament, but you can catch all the fish you want. And it's very easy to catch fish there. Why? There's so many fish in that hole. So you fish where the fish are, right? Yeah. All right. So he prayed. After he made his camels kneel down at the well of water. And behold, here I stand by the well of water, verse 13 of chapter 24. And the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Now let it be that the young woman to whom I say, please let down your pitcher that I may drink. And she says, drink. And I will also give your camels a drink. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this I will know that you have shown kindness to your master. Now this word kindness that was used in verse 12 is the word hased. It's the same word that's used here, kindness. What is that hased? God's fatherly love and care and protection and provision. And that's what he's leaning upon God for, his hased. Do you know you have that ability now as we are God's children, God's sons and daughters, we can lean upon his hased, his everlasting fatherly love. You know, I've always, I always wanted to be an example of God the Father to my son. And my son always knew that whatever, whatever he had need of, not what he wanted, but whatever he had need of, whenever there was a need, all he had to do was ask that everything was mine was his. That anything I could do for him, I would do it. Love in action. That's what God shows us. And that's what we're to show one to another. And the servant... Servant leaning upon the love of God, the hased of God, that faithfulness of God, that fatherly love of God, said, I'm here. And here's the sign, Lord, that you placed upon my heart. Now, verse 15, it happened before he had finished speaking that behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with a pitcher of water on her shoulder. Can you imagine that? Where God guides... Remember that always. God guides, God provides. You know, as long as this ministry has been operating, we've never once taken an offering for ourselves, ever. And if you've been here any length of time, you know that. We've never taken an offering. Why? God takes nothing from you. He receives what you offer. But I am absolutely 100% confident that if I'm doing exactly what God has called me to do, God will provide in every way. Where God guides, God provides and so he, not, he didn't even get, get finished with his prayer. He didn't even get off his knees. And here comes Rebecca, the answer to his prayer. So how did that happen? Who put it in his heart to pray this prayer? God did. Paul tells us in Romans 8, we not know what or how to pray. But the Holy Spirit makes intercession on our behalf. Teaching us what? Teaching us how. And you need to pray long enough where you really start to pray in the Spirit, where God begins to take over your prayers. And then God fulfills the same, and life doesn't get any better than that, does it, Melissa? Huh? You prayed for Jake, and look what happened. <laughs> now, the young woman was very beautiful. That helps, doesn't it? 
very beautiful to behold. Now, I don't know how, I don't know how he, he could discern that with a veil over her face and the way she was covered up, but nonetheless, a virgin, no man had known her, and she went down to the well, filled her pitcher, and came up. And the servant ran to meet her and said, please, let, down, let me drink a little water from your pitcher. And she said, quick, drink, my lord. Then she quickly let her pitcher down to her hand and gave him a drink. Wow, look at that. First part of the sign is fulfilled. Then she had finished, when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. Then she quickly emptied her pitcher into the trough and ran back to the well to draw water and drew for the camels and she drew back and she went 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 back. She went back. Wow. How many camels did he have? Ten. Ten. You know what an average camel will drink when they finally stop to drink after a long journey? Huh? A lot. 30 gallons. One camel. One camel will consume 30 gallons of water at one time. So how much water did she draw? This girl was not lazy. Not in any stretch of the imagination, was she? She, 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 an estimate of 300 gallons of water she poured into that trough for her, his camels to satisfy himself. You know any young ladies that would do that today? <laughs> I just prayed for cowboy cookies. I didn't get nothing. <laughs> And when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. Verse 20. Then she quickly emptied her pitcher into the trough, ran back to the well to draw water, and she drew for all of the camels. And the man wondered at her, remaining silent so as to know whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. Yeah. Just in, in awe over the fact that God answered his prayer so specifically. In such detail, do you know that there are over 300 very specific prophecies that Jesus Christ has fulfilled with regard to the first coming of the Messiah? Very specific prophecies. The, the mathematical probability of those prophecies coming true in the life of any one man, just eight major prophecies, is astronomical. There are over 300. And do you know that there are many prophecies concerning the second coming of Jesus Christ that are being fulfilled right now in our day. All that God said in his word, he will do. Make no mistake about it. The word of God is more sure than the planet you're residing on right now. You understand that? Mm. And so it was, verse 22, when the camels had finished drinking, that the man took a golden nose ring weighing half a shekel and two bracelets for her wrists weighing ten shekels of gold and said, whose daughter are you? Tell me, please, is there room in your father's house for us to lodge? And so she said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, Melchah's son, who was born to Nahor. Wow. God, what a coincidence that is, right? God led him to the woman who's exactly the relative of Abraham, her, Abraham's brother's daughter? Unbelievable. Coincidence? No. no. What does the rabbi say? No. Coincidence is not a kosher word. God is sovereign. You come with little bracelets? God's sovereignty is my sanity in these crazy, crazy times. Isn't that true? Yeah, yeah. Nose rings were in fashion then. Can you imagine such a thing? Huh? You know, I love to talk to people who have piercings, you know, especially they got piercings here and here and here and, you know. And I say, hmm, you really like those piercings? I say, you know, body piercings saved my life. They say, really? I say, yeah, his nails and his hands, his feet. Huh? Saved my life. It's a good line, right? But here, nose rings. Can you imagine such a thing? Verse 25, moreover, she said to him, we have both straw and feed enough and room to lodge. And then the man bowed down his head and he worshiped the Lord because God gave him an answer. Do you do that when God answers your prayers or God's, you know, we were praying for little Caden last night, right? Did you see the text that came out? Little Caden wasn't feeling good. They had to call the paramedics. He wasn't breathing. 
and they was having an attack from all of these uh, allergens. But he's here this morning with a smile on his face, and I, I was so delighted to see him when, I, when his car pulled in. I said, you still got to park in the back. <laughs> Blessed be the, verse 27, blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his hased, his loving kindness and his truth towards my master. As for me, being on my way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. Are you making sure that you're following the Lord's lead? Don't, don't make any decisions until you know it's the Lord. Pray about it. If you haven't got an answer, don't do anything, but pray about it. Make, make sure you know it's the Lord, or you know, you're going to make a mistake that you regret later. Every major decision, you should be very careful, and even in some of the minor ones, you see. Led me to my master's house. Verse, um, brethren, verse 28, so the young woman ran and told her mother's household these things. Now, Rebecca had a brother whose name was Laban, and Laban ran out to meet the man at the well. We know what kind of man Laban was. We found out later on, right? Who, who had to work for hard Laban? Jacob, Jacob, right? Jacob worked for his uncle Laban, and Uncle Laban was a miserable man. All Laban was concerned about, he, sold the, he saw the gold in her nose and the her bracelets on her wrist, and oh boy, his eyes lit right up, didn't they? Yep. Yeah. Mm. Like a lot of people today, favor the rich rather than those who are in need. Yeah, you, you told me you will stand up for those in need next week because the most innocent who are in need in our society today are the unborn. So you're going to stand up with me next Saturday for the unborn because they are the most in need. We can take a Saturday morning, one Saturday morning, and stand against abortion, can't we? Can we? Can you make that sacrifice? Like Abraham's servant? You're going to commit to doing it? Oh, that's wonderful. Praise God. Now, Rebecca had a brother whose name was Laban, and Laban ran out to meet the man at the well, and so it came to pass when he saw the nose ring, the bracelets on his sister's wrists, and when he heard the words of his sister, Rebecca, saying, thus the man spoke to me, that he went to the man, and there he stood in the camels at the well, and he said to him, come in, O blessed of the Lord. How much more he got? Why do you stand outside? For I have prepared the house and a place for the camels. And the man came to the house and he unloaded the camels and provided straw and feed for the camels, water to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were with him. Food was set before them to eat. And but he said, I will not eat until I have told about my errand. And he said, speak on. Isn't that amazing? You know, if I made a 450 mile journey and someone was providing me a home cooked meal, I think I'd want to eat first. What would, you know. It's like when Jesus, you know, Jesus took the disciples over to Simon, the Pharisee's house, you know, and they're going to have this banquet, and, and, and all this food is spread out, and then Jesus lays into the Pharisees, and Peter says, John, stuff as much as you can in your robe, because we ain't going to be here long. <laughs> <laughs> but rather than eat, he said, no, I need to tell you of my mission. I, I need to inform you as to why I'm here. Very direct, very forthright. And so he said, I am Abraham's servant. Verse 35, the Lord has blessed my master greatly. He has become great, and he has given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, male and female servants, camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore him a son to my master when she was old. And to him he has given all that he has. Now my master made me swear, saying, You shall not take a wife up for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I dwell, but you shall go to my father's house, to my father's family, and to take a wife for my son. And I said to my master, Perhaps the woman will not follow me. But he said to me, The Lord before whom I walk will send his angel with you and prosper your way, and you shall take a wife for my son from my family and from my father's house. You will be clear of this oath when you arrive among my family, for if they will not give her to you, then you shall be released from my oath. 
And on this day I came to the well and I said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, if you have now prospered the way in which I go, behold, I stand by this well of water and it shall come to pass that when the virgin comes out to draw water and I say to her, please give me a drink of water from her pitcher to drink. And she says, drink and I will draw for your camels. Also let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. But before I had finished speaking in my heart, there was Rebecca coming out with her pitcher on her shoulder and she went down to the well and drew water. And I said to her, please let me drink. And she made haste and let me let down her pitcher from her shoulder and said, drink and I will give you and your camels a drink also. So I drank and she gave the camels a drink also. Then I asked her and said, whose daughter are you? And she said, the daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son. And Milka bore to him So I put the nose ring on her nose and bracelets on her wrists, and I bowed my head and worshiped the Lord and blessed the Lord God of my master Abraham, who has led me in the way of truth to take the daughter of my master's son as his, excuse me, master's brother for his son. Now, now, if you will deal kindly, again, this is the word has said, and truly with my master, tell me. And if not, tell me that I may turn to the right or to the left. And Laban and Bethuel answered and said, the thing comes from the Lord. We cannot speak to you either bad or good. So the servant immediately goes. He sets out a sign. The sign is fulfilled. And even Laban, and we'll find that Laban's a very fleshly carnal man, but even Laban recognizes it's the Lord. Yeah. How many times in your life has something happened, a situation, a coincidence, where all of a sudden you just knew it, it's the Lord? Yeah. yeah. So even Laban understood that. And you know, that's, that's the witness we should be to the people around us when we live a transformed life. When they see the change that is taking place as a result of the Holy Spirit in us, we can claim it's not us, it's the Lord. It's the Lord. Yeah. Verse 51, here is Rebecca before you. Take her and go and let her be your master's wife's son's wife as the Lord has spoken. And it came to pass when Abraham's servant heard their words that he worshiped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth. You see how often he acknowledges God and gives God credit for what's taking place. And then the servant brought out jewelry of silver, jewelry of gold and clothing and gave them to Rebecca. He also gave precious things to her brother and to her mother. And he and the men who were with him ate and drank and stayed all night. And then they arose in the morning and said, send me away to my master. But her brother and her mother said, let the young woman stay with us a few days, at least 10. After that, she may go. And he said to them, do not hinder me since the Lord has prospered my way and send me away so that I may go to my master. And so they said, we will call the young woman and ask her personally. Then they called Rebecca and said to her, will you go with this man? And she said, I will, I will. You see the surrender of Rebecca? You see the the trust that the servant had and what his master Abraham had told him and then giving the sign and and God, God providing the reality of that sign being fulfilled as God placed that prayer in his heart and and now he's, 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 prayer has been answered and here is Rebecca and now it's just a matter of is she willing to go? Are you willing to go wherever it is the Lord sends you? You know, some strange things that they serve you over there. You know, Helene. I said, well, you know what the missionary's motto is? Where you lead me, I will follow. What you feed me, I will swallow. (laughs) (laughs) Verse 59. And so they sent away Rebekah, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant and his men. And they they blessed Rebekah and said to her, Our sister, may you become the mother of thousands of tens thousands. And may your descendants possess the gates of those who hate them. (laughs) Isn't that an interesting prophecy that's going to be fulfilled soon? Verse 61, then Rebekah and her maids arose, and they rode on camels and followed the man. And so the servant took Rebekah and departed. Now, Nixach came by the way of Ber Lahiroi, and he dwelt in the south, in the Negev. What does that mean, Ber Lahiroi? 
the well of the living one. What does Jesus offer us? Living water. Water. Yeah. Here Isaac is a type of Christ, and what is he going to offer to Rebekah? Living water. Mm. Verse 63, And Isaac went out to meditate in the field in the evening, and he lifted his eyes and looked, and there the camels were coming. Um, anybody have any notes with regard to what he was doing, this meditation he was involved in? There's a hint of what is taking place here in verse 67, the last verse of the chapter, the last sentence. And so Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. So what do you think this Hebrew word indicates that he meditated in the field? He was grieving. Yeah. Only God, only God can heal the brokenhearted. Hmm? And, and so often he'll bring people into our life to help, but it's God's provision, right? And so Isaac was in the field meditating over the loss of his mother Sarah, whom he loved, and she loved him. And while he's grieving and crying out to God, and you know, we, we can grieve. I know I, I grieved for almost two years when I lost my wife. I had no desire to remarry. I was dead to that. Until my sister came. And my wife died in 2006. My sister came in 2008 to care for me after I had a surgery. And I had a woman's touch back in my life. And I was so thankful. And I said, Helene, you can't go back to Bob. That's my brother-in-law. You stay here with me. I need you. He don't need you. But I was joking. But I said, you ruined me now. I, can't, I don't want to be alone anymore. God is healing me, and I want to go on. My grief has accomplished what it was set out to, to do, to have a greater dependence upon the Lord, to see that he is my fulfillment of all things. And then when God was providing me a wife in Gale, when, when I came to Gale, I was honest with her. I said, I can only offer you what I have. I, I'm a brokenhearted man. And I can, I can offer you what is left. I can take care of you as a sister and you as, to me as a brother. And that's what I have to offer you now. You, know, need, you need security. I need some comfort. Why don't we come together as brother and sister in like suffering because she lost her husband the same year I lost my wife. And love, listen to me, love is not a feeling. It's not something you fall into, you know. I fell into love, like I fall into a hole? No. That's infatuation. That's lust. That's desire. You find out what love is later. How long does it take for a marriage to smooth out? Seven to ten years. Seven to ten years is statistically. Far too many give up long before that period. Why? Because, listen to me, love is a choice. It is not a feeling. When that shadow person shows up, now the choice becomes real. Isn't that right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry? Two years. Two years. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Two years after the infatuation. For 18 to 24 months, oh, my, you know. Yeah. But after that, the knight in shining armor has got a few kinks. Hmm? The... The fair maidens become a fire-breathing dragon. <laughs> then love really becomes a choice. Isn't that not true? Yep. No, no, no. She's had the more difficult choice. I'll admit it. You know. And you agree with her. I know you agree. <laughs> I tell her where to park, too. So Isaac went out to meditate, verse 63, in the field in the evening, and he lifted up his eyes, and he looked, and there the camels were coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes. And when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel. And for she had said to the servant, who, was, who is this man walking in the field to meet us? And the servant said, it is my master. And so she took a veil and covered her face. Anybody have an understanding or an interpretation of what it means that she dismounted? 
What? Yeah, but what did she do? She got off the camel. She bowed to the ground. She laid prostrate on the ground before him. What do you think we're going to do when we see Jesus? Yeah. John had no strength to stand. John was the one who placed his head upon his breast at the last Seder, right? But then when he saw Jesus in his glory, he fell down as if dead. Here, in the Hebrew text, she bowed down to the ground in worship, in adoration, in respect, in reverence of this man. Who is this? And the servant told, told her that it was Isaac, his master's son. Verse 66, the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. And then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and he took her, Rebekah, and she became his wife and he loved her. And so Isaac was comforted by his mother's death. In that culture, in that day, what determined the marriage? The consummation. They came together. You know what dating is? Divorce, Divorce practice. <laughs> dating is divorce practice. You give your heart away, you take it back. You give it away, you take it back. You give it away, you take it back. Hmm? Do you know the statistics on remarriages, second, third remarriages? <sighs> not good, not good. The, you know, the first time you divorce, it's a painful experience, isn't it? It just gets easier the next time. It gets easier the third time. It gets easier the fourth time. Hmm. The plague, the epidemic of divorce in our country. Why? Because we take the intimacy and the relationship of marriage so casually. But what determined that we were wed is the consummation, the physical union that occurred. Listen, you know, sex is sex, right? Sex is sex. But God created sex to be a sign of the intimacy that a man would have with his wife, a wife would have with her husband. As the two become one, as he presses his life into hers, as the Holy Spirit presses his life into mine, the highest essence, the quintessence of the word intercourse is when the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within me. Do you understand that? That determines that I'm wed to him. I have never known a man. How can this be? Who said that? And then the Holy Spirit came upon. That's what happened to each of us who are born again, truly born again, resurrected in your spirit. And so Isaac took Rebekah and they were joined together and he was comforted in the loss of his mother. Mm. Go back to chapter 22. What is that? The Akada. Give me a few more minutes, please. The Akadah, chapter 22, right? That's, that's where Isaac is bound, willingly, letting himself go. Now, when, when they got to Moriah, Abraham and Isaac and the servants, he, Abraham said to his servants, I and the lad shall ascend. And they went up to the mountain, Mount Moriah. And we know that God provided a ram in the thicket. He wasn't ever intending that get Abraham would sacrifice his son. It was all a type and a sign and a symbol of what God would do with his son in offering his son, and that his son would come and willingly offer his life. The Son of Man has not come to be served, but to serve, to lay his, down, his life as a ransom for many, right? Now, look at the end of chapter 22. In verse 17, the Lord is speaking, blessing, I will bless you, multiply you, and multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand in which is upon the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. It should be the seed. What seed is that? The seed of the woman. What seed is that? Jesus himself, the virgin birth. That's the seed he's talking about here. And in your seed all the nations of the world shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Verse 19 now in particular, so Abraham returned to his young men and they arose and they went together to Beersheba and Abraham dwelt in Beersheba. Now so often in the text, it's not so much about what's being said, it's about what's being not said. What's not said? What? So what's not said? Where's Isaac? 
Isn't it interesting that the Holy Spirit engineers in the text that after Isaac, a type of Jesus Christ who lays his life down to be sacrificed, Isaac is not seen again, not heard from again until he's united with his bride. You get it? When's he coming back? When will we see him again? When he is reunited with his bride, with you and us. Isn't that amazing? Hmm? You know, there's no less than six Gentile brides in the scriptures. What are you? Who gave who to who? John chapter 17, who gave who to who? God, God the Father gave you to his son as a bride, as a gift, right? There's no less than six Gentile women in the scriptures. You have Adam and Eve, right? Eve was a Gentile. Isaac and Rebekah. Rebekah was from Ur of the Chaldees. Joseph, who did Joseph marry? Asenieth, the Egyptian, right? Joseph and the Egyptian woman. Then you had um, Moses and Jethro's daughter. What was her name? Zipporah, Zipporah. And then you had Solomon and Rahab. Rahab the harlot, remember? Gentile. And then you had Boaz and interesting. All Gentile women married to these Jewish men in every single case they're a type of Christ. What do we know about these Gentile women? They didn't die. No, they did die, didn't they? But there is no record in the scripture of any of these Gentile brides dying. We have Sarah's death recorded for us. Miriam's death is recorded. How come the Gentile brides are not mentioned in their death? And I will give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Do you understand that? As the bride of Christ now, we live eternally. It's not that we are going to gain eternal life. We have eternal life now. Now. Now, in the Jewish wedding custom, this is what we're talking about. You see, we're, we're a bride. You're a Jewish bride. Do you understand that, don't you? And you're going to have a Jewish wedding. You're, you're engaged, betrothed to a Jewish bridegroom. You understand that, right? The ketubah is where they enter into the contract. Who determines who the bride is? Papa. Papa determines the bride. Who determines the bridal price? Papa determines the bridal price. Who determines when the marriage will occur? Papa does. Papa arranges all of that. Now, now the contract is made. Arrange, you know, arranged marriages in history, arranged marriages are far more successful than these people who fall in a hole. Because it's, it's just emotion. It's just feelings. Nothing more than feelings trying to forget mine. Right? I mean, you, you get the point? So, so it's Papa who arranges the wedding. It's Papa who determines the timing of the wedding. It's Papa who determines when the bridegroom goes to get his bride. And when, did, when would the bridegroom come to get his bride? In the middle of the night, in the evening, taking her by surprise? No, no, because the friends of the bridegroom would declare the bridegroom is coming. The, listen, do you hear the Holy Spirit? Do you hear him yelling? The bridegroom is coming. The bridegroom is coming. Now, now there are some people that are hearing that. You know who's hearing that? The remnant, the body of Christ, not christened dumb, but the body of Christ. They can hear the Holy Spirit declare, the bridegroom is coming. He's coming. Now, it would never take the bride by surprise, would it? No, but the Father himself would determine the timing. Why? Because, because once the betrothal contract was made and, and they were practically married, except there was no consummation of the relationship yet, not until there was actually the wedding ceremony under the chupa, right? But the bridegroom would do what? Go back and prepare a place for his bride. You know, if he wasn't doing so well materially, he'd go and fix up his room for him and his bride. If he was a little better off, he'd go and add to his father's house, add to the home place, a room for him and his bride. Now, if he's doing really well, he'd build a place for he and his bride. Hmm. What did Jesus say? If I go, I go to prepare a place for you. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, in the way, you know. You know, Jesus is fulfilling all of the rites and the customs of the ancient Jewish wedding. Isn't that amazing? 
We are a Gentile bride. Who gave who to whom? You are a gift from God the Father to his son, a gift of a bride. And, and when the servant came all through chapter 24, does it declare the servant's name? Never. Isn't that interesting? And what is the Holy Spirit's name? We don't know. Holy Spirit's his title. It's who he is. We don't know his name, right? The Paracletos, the one who comes alongside to comfort us. But isn't that interesting? The servant never mentions his name. The only name he mentions over and over and over again is who? Isaac, my master's son. Isaac, my master's son. And who does the Holy Spirit place emphasis upon? Jesus, my master's son. Jesus, my master's son. Why is the church placing so much emphasis upon the Holy Spirit when the emphasis needs to be placed upon Christ? Right? Isn't that amazing? Isn't that a beautiful picture now of what we see that Jesus is declaring here in John 17? that all whom the Father has given to me shall come to me. And of those who come to me, I lose none. We're so secure in God's love. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Shall we stand?